Joining me now are three MPs from the different parties. Arif Varani is a parliamentary secretary and the Liberal MP for the Toronto riding of Parkdale High Park. Marilyn Gladue is a Conservative MP for the Ontario riding of Sarnia Lambton and her party's health critic. And Don Davies is the NDP member for Vancouver Kingsway and his party's health critic. All three of you, thanks for joining us. Hi, Martin. Thank pleasure. you. Let's uh, start with, we've heard from the government's point man on pot, uh, Bill Blair. So I'd like to start with the opposition members on the panel first. So first of all, Marilyn Gladue. Your Conservative MPs, uh, except for one, all of you, opposed, voted against the government's marijuana legislation. Have you asked your Conservative caucus, your Conservative colleagues in the Senate, to vote against this bill or to obstruct it or to make major changes in it? No, uh, really, we believe that the Senate just needs to do their job, the sober second thought. And uh, I did give a briefing to them at the beginning to let them understand the many flaws in this legislation, but uh, we'll wait to see what they come out with. Do you foresee, though, because there is a big question about the timing, do you foresee that analysis, sober second thought, whatever you want to call it, uh, putting them past a deadline? Well, you know, I think it's more important to get this right than to rush. And, and with 150 days left until uh, the legalization date proposed, there are still provinces that don't have legislation or plans, and there are still Indigenous people that haven't been consulted and that are uh, protesting that. So I think it's more important to get it right, and I encourage the Senate to do a diligent job. Do you think this, uh, the government will uh, fulfill their promise of bringing in the legislation by the summer? Well, the government doesn't have a great track record on keeping their promises, so I don't know. Okay, Don Davies, I'm going to ask you the question that we've been asking with regards to government promises this week. Do you think the government will keep this promise and that we will see this legislation and legalization by the summer? Well, like Marilyn, <clears throat> I, I think that this legislation is so groundbreaking that it's more important to get it right than to stick to some arbitrary deadline. Uh, the government has been using the date of July 1, 2018 as their target date, but I did notice that Prime Minister Trudeau uh, equivocated on that date, uh, I guess, a few weeks ago. So it seems that they're looking for some wiggle room. Um, I, I am convinced that the government will bring in cannabis legalization legislation. I'm not 100% sure it'll happen uh, quite on the schedule they want, but again, I think that there's some, as Marilyn pointed out, some significant problems with the bill that I would like to see fixed. Okay, let's, okay I, I want to go back towards the, the government member, but let's start with that then. Okay, what do you consider the major problems with this bill? Start with you, uh, Don Davies. Well, there's a number of them. First of all, from a matter of policy, I'd like to see the government instruct federal prosecutors to quit prosecuting people right now. It, it's absurd that we're actually hanging criminal convictions on, on people right now for doing something that we all admit will be legal in a short period of time. In terms of flaws of the bill, the bill does not deal with pardons in any way whatsoever. I don't know how you can bring in flagship legislation on cannabis and, and fail to, to deal with the issue of the hundreds of thousands of Canadians that have pardons. Uh, it doesn't legalize edibles and concentrates, and that's directly contrary to the purposes of the bill, where it says that the purpose of this legislation is to allow Canadians to have access to safe, regulated cannabis, and second, to eliminate the uh, illicit market. But somehow or other, the government forgot about edibles and concentrates, and that'll still be in the black market for the next uh, at least year and a half. And uh, people who rely on, on a healthy way to access uh, cannabis will now have to rely on unregulated black market produced edibles and concentrates. And, and finally, um, the patchwork of, of approaches across the, this country, I think, are going to be very confusing to people by leaving to the provinces different distribution methods, different ages of consumption, different amounts you can possess and different amounts you can grow at home, it's going to be a very confusing situation for Canadians. Okay, I did say I want to get back to the Liberal member on the panel, but I do want to ask you, uh, Marilyn Gladue, uh, if you'd have to choose one of your major concerns about the uh, legislation or the government's plans, it would be what? Uh, well, in addition to everything Don said, I think uh, the fact that they have a Clause 8C, children 12 to 17 can possess up to 5 grams of cannabis. That is the wrong message on anyone's page. The Canadian Medical Association has been clear. People that consume marijuana under the age of 25 are going to have serious mental health issues, psychotic diseases, depression, anxiety, and 10% will become addicted. So that's just wrong. Okay, Arif Arani, uh, what do you make of, you've heard obviously the debate, and, and even during the holiday season, you were back in your riding in Toronto, you've heard people's concerns. What do you make of it and how do you answer some of the concerns that have been raised by your colleagues and probably by some constituents? So what I've heard from constituents and what I'm hearing from my colleagues is that we've got legislation. I think there's a number of things I need to respond to. The goal of the legislation is that the current model is not working. 
right? Canadian youth are, have the highest rates of marijuana usage in the industrialized world. So what's, working, what's happening right now is not working. What we're trying to do is get it out of the hands of children and get money out of the hands of criminals. So that needs to be restated over and over again. In terms of some of the points that Don raised, uh, we are not revisiting the Constitution. There is a constitutional division of powers, the same way that the provinces decide how dis the distribution occurs for alcohol and tobacco, the same would apply here. In terms of the concerns uh, that have been raised uh, in respect of uh, what the Senate will do with this bill, we hope the Senate will apply sober second thought. That's the Senate's job. We also believe that in terms of implementing on a campaign commitment, that the Senate will apply over second thought, but will not impede legislation that Canadians are asking for. What we are seeing right now is that we need to address the concerns that are out there. We are addressing things like an education campaign by putting $34 million into education. We've allocated $540 million over the next five years into enforcement and policing because, again, the current system is not working. Will, there, will this be a work in progress? Absolutely it will. But what Canadians are, what I'm hearing from, from Canadians in my writing and from Canadians elsewhere, is that the current system is not working and they are applauding our government for having the strength and the fortitude to address that and having the leadership to do so. Okay, I want to ask, uh, you, we have two of you who come from Ontario and one of you who comes from BC. One of the interesting things about this legislation and about this initiative is how much of it is dependent on the provinces. One of you alluded to the fact that, uh, I think Don Davies, you alluded to the fact that there are very different regimes that are going to be brought in province to province. Marilyn Gladue uh, and Eri Ferrani, you are in Toronto and in southern Ontario. Uh, Don Davies, you're in BC. If you look at your province, your home province that you live in, uh, what do you make of the big goal of this legislation and that is to somehow move out the illicit market, move out the black market and encourage uh, a regulated, controlled market. Um, let's take Ontario. Uh, first of all, to you, Arif and, uh, and Marilyn, um, Ontario is only going to have about 44 stores in the next year. That's for a population of 13 million people. Uh, is that going to make even a dent into the illicit market? No, it's not. And certainly if they, if they took the example from Colorado, uh, Colorado allowed home grow, and here they are five years up the road, and they still are having a huge issue with organized crime. We're going to see the same thing in Ontario. We've already got 120 illegal dispensaries, and there's been no enforcement on them. So no, organized crime is not going to be going away anytime soon with the Ontario model. Harif Rani, what do you make of it? I mean, is the answer... I don't know, to talk to your provincial governments and get them to ramp up more? Or are you confident that they will have distribution systems in place to actually arrive at the goal of this legislation? We are confident. And I'll tell you a couple of things just as a case in point. In terms of dealing with the, with the provinces and the territories, we've been sitting down with them. We've, we've been doing that across governments. It's, it's a stark contrast to the previous government under Stephen Harper where FPTs and the, that kind of uh, leadership convening of premiers and first ministers meetings just didn't happen. Most recently you'll know uh, that there was a meeting with the different leaders of the provinces about how to allocate the revenues being generated. Right. Again, this is not a revenue generating exercise. The Excise Tax Act is being applied here to, to create revenue that will help us with in education, enforcement and administration. And we heard from the provinces who said to us they want 75 cents of every dollar to go to their uh, provincial treasuries so they can execute exactly just that. We heard from that, we listened to that, and we're delivering on that. But on the market, is, federal, right, federalism but is, is, Ontario, is Ontario, in terms of marketing and distributing, is, is Ontario even going to be fast enough out of the gate if, if you look at what the goal of the legislation and the new regime is, and that is to, to move out black market, uh, black market marijuana? on it. Well, we're confident that uh, uh, Ontario has taken steps to put in a plan, and they were one of the early ones out of the gate in terms of doing the consultations necessary and taking the study to implement a plan. They've indicated that it will be around 40 uh, outlets, as you mentioned, but that's a starting point, not an ending point. Obviously, phasing out the black market takes time. That's the end goal. That's what Ontario is working towards. That's certainly what Canada is working okay, towards. Okay, Don Davies on the other coast, uh, out in uh, B.C., what's your impression of how things will play themselves out based on what the British Columbia model is going to be? Well, <clears throat> I think everybody is pretty much aware that British Columbia is one of the largest uh, producers mm -hmm. of cannabis in the country. We have a very, very well-developed and mature production and distribution uh, system. Uh, frankly, it produces billions of dollars of cannabis um, uh, already. So one of the major concerns that I'm hearing in British Columbia is that we can find a way to um, allow the small craft artisanal growers who um, are absolutely law-abiding in every other respect to come into the legalized market. Um, so that's a very large concern is how can we find a way to make sure that those people can play a meaningful role in the legalized market. And second, the distribution model is also very much of concern. 
Um, we have dispensaries uh, in Vancouver and, and in other uh, towns and municipalities in British Columbia that have a lot of expertise built up and they're concerned that they may be frozen out of the distribution model if we go to say like Ontario has done an exclusive Ontario Liquor Control Board kind of model. So um, I think if, if we and, and we in New Democrats we actually support the legislation we believe that we should be legalizing cannabis um, but we also want to make sure that it's done uh, properly and uh, in a way that actually meets the objectives of the Act, which, which I don't think the government's going to do on this time schedule. Okay, last question, just briefly to all three of you. Just, we'll just start with you, Arif or Annie. Uh, in terms of, I think you alluded to it, there's a pilot project in terms of uh, impaired, drug-impaired driving, uh, and there's new legislation, but uh, do we have the resources? Do provincial governments and regional and municipal police forces have the resources uh, if there's going to be a wider distribution of marijuana, legalized marijuana? So what we're committed to doing is ensuring that the police forces around the country do have those resources, including the ability to do tests for things like impaired, impaired by drug in terms of reducing uh, vehicle uh, road safety uh, problems or road dangers. That's a critical component. We heard from police officers. You know, it's very important. With some, some of the things raised earlier on by both of my colleagues were that it's better to get it right than to rush it, and we hear that. That's why we had a one-year-long task force led by former Minister of Justice and McClellan. That's why we've been very, very methodical in approaching this. And that's why we're going slow on things like edibles that Don mentioned, because edibles, we've learned from other jurisdictions, are sometimes packaged in ways that make them enticing to children. If the goal is to keep this out of the hands of children, we're not going to rush forward with a plan on edibles until we get it right. Marilyn Gladue, in terms of impairment, in terms of impaired driving. Well, the police and the municipalities are saying they're not going to be ready. And if we look at Colorado and Washington, they saw a doubling of traffic fatalities for cannabis. And so there's going to be, a, you know, an unintended and dangerous consequence for Canadians uh, unless we slow down and do the public education and get things properly in place. Okay, Don Davies, you mentioned that uh, I, I know your premier used the same term, a mature marijuana market in B.C. Uh, I don't know if it will affect, legalization will even affect in a major way the consumption levels in B.C., but what about the Impaired, uh, in the impaired driving concerns. Well, before I gather, I have to correct something my colleague mentioned. Uh, uh, actually, the task force led by McClellan recommended immediate uh, legalization of edibles and concentrates, and, and actually Colorado has state-of-the-art uh, regulations specifically to keep edibles out of the hands of children. By leaving it outside of this act, they've left it in the hands of organized crime, and last time I checked, organized crime is not putting their, their edible products in child-proof containers. That's why you, sh you need to regulate it now. But on your question, um, uh, impaired driving is, is a concern. I I'm concerned about uh, the per se limits in the in the uh, legislation and uh, from what I can tell right now we do not yet have the technology or the science to be able to accurately measure THC and levels of impairment in people Thanks, and I, I think you're going to see a lot of uh, charter challenges you're going to see a lot of litigation because the the Liberals have rushed that part of it I don't think they know what they're doing on the impaired driving uh, portion of this, of okay. this issue. Okay, on that note, we're out of time, but I want to thank all three of you for taking part in this discussion. I know it will not be the last discussion we have on this issue. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Martin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.